Due to launch in late 2024, the UK Net Zero Carbon Building Standard is the UK's first cross-industry standard that brings together net zero carbon requirements for all major building types. The standard will set out metrics by which net zero carbon performance is evaluated, as well as performance targets or limits that will need to be met. These are likely to include energy use, upfront embodied carbon and life cycle embodied carbon, with other metrics such as space heating, cooling demand and peak load also to be considered. It will also cover the approach to carbon accounting, procuring renewable energy and the treatment of residual emissions including carbon offsetting. It is expected that these claims will be required to be validated based on in-use measured data and interim verification of an asset at the design stage or once the asset is built but not yet operating that may also be considered. Performance targets will align with science-based trajectories that are needed to achieve net zero by 2050 and a 78% reduction by 2035 in the UK. The RICS Whole Life Carbon Methodology version 2 is likely to be considered to be the approved methodology for embodied carbon assessments and SIPSI TM54 calculations for operational energy. The standard is also likely to accept the neighbours rating scheme as a mean of demonstrating compliance with the operational energy requirements specifically for office developments. The approach will be applicable to both existing and new buildings such as homes, offices, education, industry, retail, hotels and healthcare. And to start, the focus will be on the most common building typologies, especially for those uh, for which industry stakeholders already have robust performance data available to inform the setting of performance targets. The standard will not initially apply to infrastructure and it is expected that the standard will be released for beta testing in the spring of 2024 with a full launch later in the year. A project can only be verified as net zero carbon in line with the standard once one year's full use of in-use data has been collated, providing the appropriate limits have been met. This verification will be via a third party, uh, although it is yet to be defined who that third party will be. It is likely that there will be interim options to demonstrate that the project is on track to be net zero carbon at design stage and also at practical completion. And in its first iteration, new build projects and whole building retrofits must apply the net zero carbon building standard rules on a whole building basis. And this is a potentially a barrier for multi-use developments and split tenant buildings. Uh, and there's a concern that has been raised by some of the working groups developing the standard. A delineated version of the standard uh, will be produced later, which will be suitable for those project types. It's likely that the standard will be widely adopted across the industry with clients that wish to align their projects to UK projects to the standard as soon as possible. And by complying with the standard, developers will be able to promote their UK developments as net zero carbon. The UK government announced in December 2023 that it intends to introduce a Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism or CBAM by 2027 and this follows a similar approach being taken by the EU. The CBAM will ensure that products from overseas are subject to a comparable carbon price to those being produced in the UK and this will reduce the risk of carbon leakage in the affected sectors. Carbon leakage is where the production and associated emissions is moved from one country to another due to their different levels of carbon pricing and climate regulation. CBAM works by imposing a fee on carbon intensive goods from countries with less stringent climate policy and in the UK scheme this will apply a charge on the carbon emissions embodied in imports from sectors such as aluminium, cement, ceramics, fertilisers, glass, hydrogen and iron and steel. The exact charge applied by CBAM will depend of course on the amount of carbon emitted in the production of the imported goods and that will be adjusted if any carbon price has already been applied in the country of origin. So for example, imports from the EU will have been subject to a carbon pricing system through the EU emissions trading system. And whilst the UK CBAM is at a very early design stage and several details are yet to be decided, there are a few things in the announcement that show that it's different from the EU version. Firstly, the UK does not seem to be including electricity, which is in the EU CBAM within its initial scope. But instead, the UK has included ceramics and glass, which are not in the EU CBAM. The UK CBAM is also going to be implemented by 2027, whereas the UK, uh, the EU rather, CBAM is already in a transitional phase and is to be fully implemented by the 1st of January 2026. And the UK system will also involve a levy, which is different from the EU version which involves purchase of certificates. That might not affect the uh, amounts due just the way that it's applied. 
the UK CBAM will be applied to scope one and scope two and select precursor product emissions in imported products. And as with the EU version, scope three emissions are not going to be initially included. CBAM liability will lie directly with the importer of the imported products within the scope um, on the basis of the embodied emissions of the imported goods. So what does all that mean? Well, if your company procures materials directly and you're named on customs paperwork, you will need to report on those scope three emissions for the carbon embedded in the CBAM goods that you're importing. It also might mean increased costs from the supply chain for some imported materials. So whereas uh, the supply chain import materials to the UK of affected goods, they're going to need to report and those reporting obligations will have the potential to increase costs and those could be passed on to ultimately customers and clients. For example, assuming the costs for CBAM are similar to the EU scheme, the cost of imported Chinese aluminium products could rise by up to as much as 17%, assuming the costs are fairly similar. Cost liability will depend on the greenhouse gas emissions intensity of the imported good and the gap between the carbon price applied in the country of origin, if there is one, and the carbon price that would have been applied had that good been produced in the UK. Clients who import CBAM goods into the UK will need to get prepared to ensure compliance and that might involve several steps, for example, conducting a materiality assessment of CBAM's impact on your supply chain, setting up some robust carbon accounting systems if they are not already in place to verify uh, and also verify that they're adequate, engage your suppliers to extract the CBAM data, monitor the regulatory developments uh, as the system and scheme develops, and uh, also important to note, the UK CBAM will be linked with the UK Emissions Trading Scheme and that might affect sectors and clients that operate in particularly energy intensive sectors, things like power generation and aviation. Also on the 18th of December, uh, the UK ETS Authority announced two consultations about how to improve the ETS uh, and one of those focuses on free allocations that are under that system. So that might have a direct impact on the costs of CBAM. And it's expected that as with the EU CBAM, the introduction of financial impacts under the UK version will be aligned with those free allowances. There are of course going to be further developments and announcements during 2024 and consultations planned which may identify further risks and opportunities. So it might be a good idea to assign internal responsibility for this in consultation with legal counsels to help manage preparations continue to monitor and assess the legislative developments on this topic and perhaps respond to the ETS consultation about free allocations and future consultations on this UK CBAM regime and consider options for harmonising your data collection reporting procedures across EU and UK CBAM regulations as they enter force. Human rights and environmental due diligence laws are already in place in Germany, France, the Netherlands, UK and Norway and an EU directive is on the way. In February 2022, the European Commission adopted a proposal for the Directive on Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence. The proposed directive sets out the rules for regulating due diligence obligations to ensure that companies identify, prevent and mitigate adverse impacts on human rights or the environment due to their activities and it will require large companies to conduct HRED as part of their due diligence obligations and applies to all companies operating in the EU regardless of their sector. This directive is expected to come into force sometime in 2024. In the UK in November 2023, Baroness Young of Hornsey introduced a Commercial Organisations and Public Authorities Duty Human Rights and Environment Bill to the House of Lords and if passed that bill would introduce mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence into UK law to strengthen the existing requirements under the Modern Slavery Act. This would apply to all UK companies and non-UK companies that carry out business in the United Kingdom and means it could have an extraterritorial reach in a similar way to the UK Bribery Act. If passed, Commercial organisations and public authorities will have a duty to prevent human rights and environmental harms as far as is reasonably practicable with respect to their operations, products and services and those of their subsidiaries throughout their value chains. Reasonable HRED must include informed, meaningful and safe engagement with stakeholders depending on the size, scale and context of the organisation. Obligated organisations would also be required to take a responsible disengagement approach 
towards suspending or terminating a business relationship as a result of a due diligence assessment and based on a worldwide turnover exceeding a certain threshold which is to be defined produce an annual report setting out plans of HRED for the coming year and assessing the effectiveness of HRED in the previous year. Commercial organisations that fail to prevent human rights or environmental harms could be liable for civil damages or criminal sanction under the bill. The bill also provides guidance on HRED and as minimum specifies that it procedures must include integrating human rights and environmental due diligence into policies and management systems, identifying, addressing and, ass addressing and assessing actual or potential human rights or environmental harms through prevention, mitigation and remediation, establishing and maintaining effective grievance mechanisms, tracking, verifying, monitoring and assessing the effectiveness of the measures that have been taken and their outcomes, and communicating with stakeholders regularly and publicly on the findings. The bill also states that audit reports, certification schemes and memberships in initiatives for dialogue and learning are not sufficient to fulfil the obligation to conduct due diligence and civil penalties for non-compliance could be including fines of up to 10% of a company's global turnover and exclusion from public contracts for a period of up to five years. Criminal sanctions for companies are also considered in the bill in the event a person associated with the commercial organisation engages in certain specified conduct to obtain or retain business or advantage in the conduct of business for the organisation. And the bill states that board directors will be collectively responsible for ensuring compliance, placing a clear emphasis on the need for good and effective governance around an organisation's HRED programme. And if a commercial organisation does not conduct HRED in the financial year or it provides false or incomplete information in its public reports, then responsible individuals could face fines and or up to two years of imprisonment. Architects Declare UK has created a draft document entitled Building Blocks to Transform the Built Environment. It's billed as a manifesto for the next UK government and will be launched at the UK Houses of Parliament in March 2024. It aims to create a regenerative built environment that enables society and nature to thrive, creating jobs, improving health and restoring the natural world. The draft document calls for climate leadership by the next government to incorporate far-reaching system changes and implement them at a national scale. The Building Blocks offers a practical and impactful and implementable set of policies to transform the built environment based on prioritising resource efficiency, kick-starting the circular economy and restoring social and natural environments. Some upcoming UK government consultations, links of which will be in the description below. Firstly, the government is consulting on the future homes and building standards, which relates to changes to Part 6, Part L and Part F of the building regulations for dwellings and non-domestic buildings, and is seeking evidence on Part O, which is overheating. This closes on 6th of March 2024. Also closing on the 6th of March 2024 is a consultation on the home energy model, and that will replace the standard assessment procedure, or SAP, for the energy rating of homes. If you use plant and equipment on site, you might be interested in the consultation on non-road mobile machinery, or NRMM, which runs to the 26th of March 2024. The UK government are seeking views on how NRMM might decarbonise as part of the government's wider net zero strategy. And finally, the Environment Agency in England are consulting on changes to water charges for permits and their regulatory activity, and that might affect you if you discharge or abstract water. Their consultation runs until the 11th of March. Well, that's it for this short horizon scanning update for Q1 2024. If you found it useful, please subscribe so that you're notified of future updates and press the like button to notify other users of this platform. Many thanks and see you next time.